there's a reason why it's half past now because I um, was recording it and <laughs> decided that um, I didn't want to click go live so I've done the whole thing and I'm gonna have to do it again now so yeah this is a uh, inquiry concerning human understanding I'm gonna be reading um, section one today which is of the different species of philosophy um, so I'm just thinking I'm just going to dive straight into it I've got some analysis to follow up with afterwards but we'll see how we go um, cool section one of the different species of philosophy moral philosophy or the science of human nature may be treated after two different manners each of which has its own particular merit and may contribute to the entertainment, instruction and reformation of mankind. The one considers man chiefly as born for action and as influenced by his measures by taste and sentiment, pursuing one object and avoiding another. According to the value which these objects seem to possess and according to the light in which they present themselves, as virtue of all objects is allowed to be more valuable. These species of philosophers paint her in the most amiable colours borrowing all helps from poetry and eloquence and treating their subject in an easy and obvious manner and such as is best fitted to please the imagination and engage the affections. They select the most striking observations and instances from common life, place opposite characters in proper contrast and allure, luring us into the paths of virtue by the views of glory and happiness, direct our steps in these paths by the soundest precepts and most illustrious examples. They make us feel the difference between vice and virtue. They excite and regulate our sentiments. And so they can but bend our hearts into the love of probity and true honour. They think that they have fully attained the end of all their labours. <clears throat> the other species of philosophers consider man in the light of a reasonable rather than active being and endeavour to form his understanding more than cultivate his manners. They regard human nature as a subject of speculation and with narrow scrutiny examine it in order to find those principles which regulate our understanding, excite our sentiments and make us approve or blame any particular object, action or behaviour. They think it a reproach to all literature that philosophy should not yet have been fixed beyond controversy, the foundation of morals, reasoning and criticism and should forever talk of truth and falsehood, vice and virtue, beauty and deformity, without being able to determine the source of these distinctions. While they attempt this arduous task, they are deterred by no difficulties, but proceeding from particular instances to general principles, they still push their inquiries to principles more general and rest not satisfied till they arrive at those original principles by which in every science all human curiosity must be bounded. Though their speculations seem abstract and even unintelligible to common readers, they aim at the approbation of the learned and the wise. They think themselves sufficiently compensated for the labour of their whole lives. If they can discover some hidden truths which may contribute to the instruction of posterity. It is certain that the easy and obvious philosophy will always, with the generality of mankind, have the preference above the accurate and obtuse and by many will be recommended not only as more agreeable but more useful than the other. It enters into common life, moulds the heart and affections, and by touching those principles which actuate men, reforms their conduct and brings them nearer to that model of perfection which it describes. On the contrary, the abstruse philosophy, being founded on a turn of mind which cannot enter into business and action, vanishes when the philosopher leaves the shade, comes into open day, nor can its principles easily retain any influence over the, our conduct or behaviour. The feelings of our heart, the agitation of our passions, the vehemence of our affectations dissipate all its conclusions and reduce the profound philosopher to a mere plebeian. This also must be confessed that the most durable as well as justice fame has been acquired by the easy philosophy and that abstract reasoners seem hitherto to have enjoyed only a momentary reputation from the caprice or ignorance of their own age but have not been able to support their renown with a more equitable posterity. It is easy for a profound philosopher to commit a mistake in his sub subtle reasonings, 
and one mistake is the necessary parent of another while he pushes on his consequences and is not deterred from embracing any conclusion by its unusual appearance or its contradiction to popular opinion but a philosopher who proposes only to represent the common sense of mankind in more beautiful and more engaging colors if by accident he falls into error goes no further but renewing his appeal to common sense and the natural sentiments of any mind returns to the right path and secures himself from any dangerous illusions. The fame of Cicero flourishes at present, but that of Aristotle is utterly decayed. La Bruyere passes the seas and still maintains his reputation, but the glory of Melanbranche is confined to his own nation and his own age. And Addison perhaps will be read with pleasure when Locke shall be entirely forgotten. The mere philosopher is a character which is commonly but little acceptable to the world, as being supposed to contribute nothing either to the advantage or pleasure of society. While he lives remote from communication with mankind and is wrapped up in principles and notions equally remote from their comprehension, on the other hand the mere ignorant is still more despised, nor is anything deemed a surer sign of an illiberal genius than an age and nation where the sciences flourish, than to be entire destitute of all relish and those noble entertainments. The most perfect character is supposed to lie between those extremes, retaining an equal ability and taste for books, company and business, preserving in conversation that discernment and delicacy which arise from polite letters, and in that business, that probity and accuracy that are a natural result of a just philosophy. In order to diffuse and cultivate so accomplished a character, nothing can be more useful than compositions of the easy style and manner which draw not too much from life, require no deep application or retreat to be comprehended, and send back the student among mankind full of noble sentiments and wise precepts, applicable to every exigence of human life by means of such compositions. Virtue becomes amiable, science agreeable, company instructive, and retirement entertaining. Man is a reasonable being and as such receives from science his proper food and nourishment. But so narrow are the bounds of human understanding that little satisfaction can be hoped for in this particular, either from the extent or security of his acquisitions. Man is a sociable, no less than a reasonable being, but neither can he always enjoy company agreeable and amusing, or preserve the proper relish for them. Man is also an active being, and from that disposition, as well as from the various necessities of human life, must submit to business and occupation. But the mind requires some relaxation. It cannot always support its bent to care and industry. It seems that then that nature has pointed out a mixed kind of life as most suitable to the human race and has secretly admonished them to allow none of these biases to draw too much so as to incapacitate them from other occupations and entertainments. Indulge your passion for science, says she, but let your science be human. And such as may have a direct reference to action in society. Abstruse thought and profound researches I prohibit and will severely punish by the pensive melancholy which they introduce, by the endless uncertainty in which they involve you, and by the cold reception which your pretended discovery shall meet with when communicated. Be a philosopher. But, I missed your philosophy, be still a man. Were the generality of mankind contented to prefer the, the easy philosophy to the abstract and profound, without throwing any blame or contempt on the latter, it may not be improper, perhaps, to comply with this general opinion and allow every man to enjoy, without opposition, his own taste and sentiment. But, as the matter is often carried further, even to the absolute rejecting of all profound reasonings, or what is commonly called metaphysics, we shall now proceed to consider what can be reasonably be pleaded on their behalf. We may begin with observing that one considerable advantage which results from the accurate and abstract philosophy is its subserviency to the easy and humane, which, without the former, can never attain a sufficient degree of exactness in its sentiments, precepts, or reasonings, 
all polite letters are nothing but pictures of human life in various attitudes and situations and inspire us with various sentiments of praise or blame, admiration or ridicule, according to the qualities of the object which they set before us. Artists must be better qualified to succeed in this undertaking who besides a delicate taste and quick apprehension possesses an accurate knowledge of the internal fabric, the operations of the understanding, the workings of the passions and the various species of sentiment which discriminate vice and virtue. How painful soever this inward search or inquiry may appear, it becomes in some measure requisite to those who would describe with success the obvious and outward appearances of life and manners. The anatomist presents to the eye the most hideous and disagreeable objects, but his science is useful to the painter in delineating even a Venus or a Helen. While the latter enjoys all the richest colour of his art and gives his figures the most graceful, engaging airs, he must still carry his attention to the inward structure of the human body, the position of the muscles, the fabric of the bones and the use and figure of every part or organ, Accuracy is in every case advantageous to beauty and just reasoning to delicate sentiment. In vain would we exalt the one by depreciating the other. Besides, we may observe in every art profession, even those which most concern life or action, that a spirit of accuracy, however required, carries all of them nearer their perfection and renders them more subservient to the interests of society. And though a philosopher may live remote from business, the genius of philosophy, if carefully cultivated by several, must gradually diffuse itself through the whole society and bestow a similar correctness on every art and calling. The politician will acquire greater foresight and suitability in the subdividing and balancing of power of the lawyer more method and finer principles in his reasoning and the general more regularity in his discipline and more caution in his plans and operations the stability of modern governments above the ancient and in the accuracy of modern philosophy have improved and probably will still improve by similar graduations were there no advantage to be reaped from these studies beyond the gratification of an innocent curiosity yet ought not even this to be despised as being one accession of those few safe and harmless pleasures which are bestowed upon the human race. The sweetest and most inoffensive path of life leads through the avenues of science and learning, and whoever can remove those obstructions in, in this way, or open up any new prospect, ought so far to be esteemed a benefactor to mankind. And though these researches may appear painful and fatiguing, it is with some minds, as with some bodies, which being endowed with vigorous and florid health, require severe exercise and reap a pleasure from what, to the generality of mankind, may seem burdensome and laborious. Obscurity, indeed, is painful to the mind as well as to the eye, but to bring light from obscurity by whatever labour must needs be delightful in, enjoy, in rejoicing. But this obscurity in the profound and abstract philosophy is objective to, not only as painful and fatiguing, but as the inevitable source of uncertainty and error. Here indeed lies the justest and most plausible objection against a considerable part of metaphysics, that they are not properly a science, but arise from the fruitless efforts of human vanity, which would penetrate into subjects equally inaccessible to the understanding, or from the craft of popular superstitions, which, being able to un unable to defend themselves on fair ground, raise these intertangling branches to cover and protect their weakness. Chased from the open country, these robbers fly into the forest and lie in wait to break in upon every unguarded avenue of the mind and overwhelm it with religious fears and prejudices. The stoutest antagonist, if he remit his watch a moment, is oppressed. And many, through cowardice and folly, open the gates to the enemies and willingly receive them with reverence of submission as their legal sovereigns. But... Is this a sufficient reason why philosophers desist from such researches and leave superstition still in possession, possession of her retreat? Is it not possible to draw an opposite conclusion and perceive the necess necessity of carrying the war in the most secret recesses of the enemy? In vain do we hope that men from frequent disappointment will at last abandon such airy sciences and discover the proper provenance of human reason. For, besides, that many persons find too sensible an interest in perpetually recalling such topics. 
Besides this, I say, the motive of the blind despair can never reasonably have place in the sciences, since, however unsuccessful former attempts may have proved, there is still room to hope that the industry, good fortune, or improved sagacity of succeeding generations may reach discoveries unknown to former ages. Each adventurous genius will still leap at the arduous prize and find himself stimulated, rather than discouraged by the failures of his predecessors. While he hopes that the glory of achieving so hard an adventure is reserved for him alone, the only method of freeing learning at once from these obtuse questions is to inquire seriously into the nature of human understanding and shew from an exact analysis of its powers and capacity that by which no means fitted for such remote and obtuse subjects. We must submit to this fatigue in order to live at ease ever after and must cultivate true metaphysics with some care in order to destroy the false and adulterate. Indolence, which to some persons affords a safeguard against this deceitful philosophy, is, with others, overbalanced by curiosity and despair, which, at some moments, prevails, may give place afterwards to sanguine hopes and expectations. Accurate and just reasoning is the only Catholic remedy, fitted for all persons and all dispositions, and this alone is able to subvert that abstruse philosophy and metaphysical jargon, which being met mixed up with proper superstition, popular superstition, renders it in a manner impenetrable to careless reasoners and gives it the air of science and wisdom. Besides this advantage of rejecting after deliberate inquiry the most uncertain and disagreeable part of learning, there are many positive advantages which result from accurate scrutiny into the powers and faculties of human nature. It is remarkable concerning the operations of the mind that, though most intimately present to us, yet whenever they become the object of reflection they seem involved in obscurity. Nor can the eye readily find those lines and boundaries which discriminate and distinguish them. The objects are too fine to remain long in the same aspect or situation and must be apprehended in an instant by a superior penetration derived from nature and improved by habit and reflection. It becomes, therefore, no inconsiderable part of science barely to know the different operations of the mind, to separate them from each other, to class them under their proper heads, and to correct all that seeming disorder in which they lie involved, when made the object of reflection and inquiry. This task of ordering and distinguishing has no merit when performed with regard to external bodies. The object of our senses, senses rises in its value when directed towards the operations of the mind in proportion to the difficulty and labour which meet in performing it. And if we can go no further in this mental geography or delineation of the distinct parts and powers of the mind, it is at least a satisfaction to go so far. And the more obvious this science may appear, and it is by no means obvious, the more contemptible still must the ignorance of it be esteemed in all pretenders to learning and philosophy. Nor can there remain any suspicion that this science is uncertain and chimerical, unless we should entertain such a scepticism as is entirely subversive of all speculation and even powers. It cannot be doubted that the mind is endowed with several powers and faculties, that these powers are distinguished from each other, distinct from each other, and what is really distinct to the immediate perception may be distinguished by reflection, and consequently that there is a truth and falsehood in all propositions on this subject and a true and falsehood which lie not beyond the compass of human understanding. There are many obvious distinctions of this kind, such as those between the will and understanding, the imagination and passions which fall between the comprehension of every human creature, and the finer and more philosophical distinctions are no less real and certain, though more difficult to be comprehended. Some injustices, especially late ones of success in these inquiries, may give us a juster no notion of the certainty and solidity of this branch of learning, and shall we esteem it worthy of the labour of a philosopher to give us the true system of the planets and adjust the position and order of those remote bodies, while we still affect to overlook those who, with so much success, delineate the parts of the mind in which we are so intimately concerned. But when may we not hope that philosophy, if cultivated with care and encouraged by the attention of the public, may carry its researches still farther 
to discover, at least to some degree, the secret springs and principles by which the human mind is actuated in its operations. Astronomers have long contented themselves with proving from the phenomena of the true motions, order and magnitude of the hair building bodies, till a philosopher at last arose, who seems from the happiest reasoning to have determined the laws and forces by which the revolutions of the planets are governed and directed. The like has been performed with regard to other parts of nature, and there is no reason to despair of equal success in our inquiries describing the mental powers in economy. If prosec if pr <laughs> If prosecuted with equal capacity and caution, it is probable that one operation and principle of the mind depends on the other, which again may be resolved into one, into one more general and universal. And how far these researches may possibly be carried, it will be difficult for us before or even after a careful trial exactly to determine. This is certain that attempts of this kind are every day made, even by those who philosophize the most negligently. And nothing can be more requisite than to enter upon the enterprise with thorough care and attention, that if it lie within the compass of human understanding, it may at last be achieve happily achieved. If not, it may, however, be rejected by with some confidence and security. This last conclusion, surely, is not desirable, nor ought it to be embraced too rationally. rashly for which we distinguish the beauty and value of this species of philosophy upon such a superstition. Moralists have hitherto been accustomed when they consider the vast multitude and diversity of these actions that excite our approbation or dislike to search for some common principle on which this variety of sentiments must depend. And though they have sometimes carried the matter too far by their passion for one general principle, it must, however, be confessed that they are ex are excusable in expecting to find some general principles into which all vices and virtues are justly to be resolved. The like has been the endeavour of critics, logicians and even politicians. Nor have their attempts been wholly unsuccessful, though perhaps longer time, greater accuracy and more ardent application may bring these sciences still nearer their perfection. To throw up at once all pretentious of this kind may justly seem too rash, precipitate and dogmatical than even the most boldest and most affirmative philosophy that has ever attempted to impose its crude dictates and principles upon mankind. What though these reasonings concerning human nature seem abstract and of difficult comprehension? This affords no presumption of their falsehood. On the contrary, it seems impossible that what has hitherto escaped so many wise and profound philosophers can be very obvious and easy, and whatever pains these researches may cost us, we may think ourselves sufficiently recorded, rewarded, not only in point of profit, but of pleasure. If by that means we can make our addition to stock of knowledge in subjects of such unspeakable importance. But as, after all, the abstractedness of these speculations is no recommendation, but rather a disadvantage to them, and this difficulty may perhaps be surmounted by care and art, and the avoiding of all unnecessary detail, we have in the following inquiry attempted to throw some light upon these subjects from which uncertainty has hitherto deterred the wise and obscurity the ignorant. <coughs> Happy if we can unite the boundaries of the different species of philosophy by reconciling profound inquiry with clearness and truth with novelty, and still more happy if, reasoning in this easy manner, we can undermine the foundations of an abstruse philosophy, which seems to have hitherto served only as a shelter to superstition and a cover to absurdity and error. So there we have the start of Hume's project. Um, so yeah, just a few things to say about the opening to the inquiry, basically. Um, Basically, my interpretation of Hume is that his main project is about the turning of the apparatus of philosophy upon itself in reaction to um, maybe the more lofty philosophies um, dogmatical philosophies, whether that be um, theocratic philosophies or um, a priori philosophies, all this sort of stuff. Hume's really 
really concerned about experience and deriving philosophies from common experience. Um, and this sort of puts him in the skeptical tradition, basically. Um, and I think I think the the concern with experience kind of and you know the the very standout um, part of his where he talks about the um, the fact we can't observe causation. Basically, he gets sort of painted as just like you know oh he's an empiricist atheist philosopher. Um, and that's basically you know usually what you get taught in a philosophy course um and that's just just wrong basically if you actually read hume you understand that there's there's much more to that that thread when you tug on it a little bit um, i just want to check i'm actually yeah my audio is going that's good cool um so yeah just a few things to pick up as we go back through this. Um, so yeah, it kind of opens with moral philosophy or the science of human nature. Now, this is confusing because when we think moral philosophy as modern people, um, contemporarily, we think like ethics, right? We think, um, but in the 18th century sense, that basically means the science of human nature, um, which, you know, that makes more sense because Hume doesn't necessarily talk about ethics. Um, implicitly uh, sorry explicitly um but he's definitely talking about the science of human nature throughout the throughout all of his work um and yeah the science of human nature i mean the focus on that it kind of implies hume's um moral naturalism you know meaning that morality ethics arises from our natural desires in, in like inclinations as social animals that morality and ethics isn't some sort of abstract property but it's sort of a, a natural substrate on top of um on top of you know a naturalist um view of the world um and this is sort of you know when i said that um hume is um primarily concerned with experience um, he says here they make us feel with emphasis the difference between vice and virtue and that's kind of what his moral or ethical outlook is basically it's about you know the sentiments it's about feeling the difference between vice and virtue now how much you would connect that to a naturalism where or maybe even like empiricism where you'd say you know ethics and morality are just you know chemical reactions in your body um, there's a there's a there's a there's an argument for that interpretation of Hume but there's also um, sort of abstract feeling in the sentiments as well um, you know it's sort of reaching out to a, a conscience now, what I mean by conscience I don't know but I think that there's there's kind of two different interpretations there of what you means when he's talking about feeling and sentiments and you know buttressing his entire philosophy on 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 the sentiments and inclinations basically um, and yeah I think this is the power of Hume's philosophy as well is that um, when he's talking about the obtruse philosophies they're they're quite they're, they're abstract things when it comes to feelings and sentiments like when we have, when we feel vice like he says here we, we you know when you feel natural disgust it's much more visceral and involuntary thing than maybe a Kantian categorical perhaps when we feel when we feel good when we feel like we're doing something good it's a much more self-evident thing than again like a lofty um deontological ethical view like Kant might have and yeah so so he sort of divides philosophies into two two categories here um those delineated like between action and reason the easy philosophies and the, the obtruse philosophies is what he says um 
you know the, the first one's definitely his sort of feeling sentiments philosophy and the second one is definitely the sort of faculty of reason abstract philosophies or the obtruse philosophies as he says um And yeah, so moving on to the next page, um, where is it? It's abstract. It's mm. one page. Okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so just struggled to find that. Um, yeah, so he's talking about abstract principles in which every science, all human curiosity must be must be bounded. This is kind of talking about the limits of cognition and just saying that when we have human curiosity, when we have an intellectual inquiry, um, we necessarily have to like we have to necessarily bound that within some some sort of set of principles. This is sort of just like a glimmer of what my interpretation of Hume, which is the deeper Hume. Um, you know, it goes beyond the mere empirical interpretation of his work. Um, yeah, so it, it's sort of you know reaching out to, you know, the principles of intellectual inquiry. Um, the fact that you know human cognition has to be bounded to um, sort of sort of you know provide a cognitive industry um to its to its inquiries um yeah and sort of another thing is i i hope when i was reading you were able to pick out a few sort of more spicy moments I think you know being around the same time as Kant I think Hume is often in the same way he's sort of painted as a you know bland empiricist philosopher is often painted as um, quite dry but at least in the opening to the inquiry he's quite quite catty um, towards the obtruse philosophers um, you know he's sort of saying here that um, you know the speculations seem abstract and that they are unintelligible to the common readers. I mean, anyone who is a common reader and has gone to try and read Kant uh, will will completely understand what he means by that. Um, and yeah, he just you know he just kind of says that these philosophers they 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 want to be seen as learned and wise, so they you know obfuscate their philosophy. Um, and in, in that in that sense, you know, he thinks that the labor of their whole lives is just kind of a lie in a way. Um, and you know, they just want to be like kind of remembered for being being lofty and incomprehensible, which is quite funny, I think. Um, yeah, so it, I think moments like that kind of make Hume ultimately as kind of is scathing as Nietzsche to read in in some points um and also kind of you know make his philosophy again like I said his, his the underlying message of his philosophy beyond the empirical stuff is that it sort of turned the the apparatus of philosophy upon itself um, and in that way it's a sort of meta philosophy which is quite um quite unique really and I think that's something that him and Sextus Empiricus sort of share in the sceptical tradition is quite unique to that. Um, so yeah, moving on. Um, yeah, the abstruse philosophy. So again, talking about metaphysics, he's saying, you know, being found on a turn of mind, saying that this is, this is an opinion. It's not like based on anything substantial or substantive. Um, and it basically, you know, it cannot enter into business and action, you know, it's not a practical philosophy which is in a way I think that's what Hume, Hume's project aims at as well um,
going to go next. Okay, one more snap. Um, where is it? Apologies for this. Right, so this is a very famous sort of refrain. Um, be a philosopher, but amidst all your philosophy, be still a man. Um, again, it's kind of Hume calling back to the fact that his philosophy is very much human grounded, is not based on sort of abstract metaphysics, is very like a very lived philosophy. Um, and he sort of goes on to say that um, the abstruse philosophies are their own punishment, you know, they um, they induce melancholy basically through their, I would say they don't sort of affirm the human experience, they don't affirm the common life, which is what Hume's philosophy is all about. Um, and you know, it's kind of, kind of like a, a proto-quietism, you know, quietism that, um, quietism in the sense that, um, the natural place of philosophy is to sort of um, provide solace to us, basically. And that's, again, very, very um, against sort of abstruse philosophy. Um, yeah, he calls uh, metaphysics the absolute rejecting rejection of all profound reasonings. So, you know, metaphysics is abstractions and speculative, like, simplif simplification. And at the end of things, like, because we don't have access to the metaphysical truth it is essentially opinion and he he sort of says um, sorry i'm not going to find it here am i um basically he says that um his philosophy wants to provide a picture of human life um and for for hume basically in humane philosophy um, every every philosopher is a painter and Hume's philosophy is a reflection of the human reality and on, on contrary on the other hand abstruse philosophy imposes its abstractions upon upon a complex reality yeah so another place which is quite interesting This is quite an interesting section here. Um, the, the quote is basically, accuracy is in every case advantageous to beauty. Which again is sort of the empirical Hume coming through. You know, he's only concerned with the accurate of what, like the accuracy of what we can know. And he, you know, he's applying this to aesthetics here as well, which is quite interesting. Um, you know, there's examples of artistic realism, you know, Venus and Helen. Um, but it does make you wonder what Hume might have said of the later movements of aesthetics, you know, abstract or modern art. Um, and yeah, so again, um, he's objecting to... Um, objection against a considerable part of metaphysics, um, which is quite an interesting because turn of phrase. Because I don't think I think this sort of hints at the fact that he's not outright rejecting metaphysics as such. He just thinks most of the abstruse reasonings um, are to be rejected by their speculative nature. Um, so yeah, this is that's that was the introduction to the inquiry con concerning human understanding. Um, hopefully this went all right. I know I tripped over myself a few times, and maybe my analysis isn't so good. But um, I th well, I don't know if this is. Let me know if you think this is all right. Um, and I think I might continue it. Um, 
but yeah, basically, this is the, this is the goal of Hume's philosophy: is to turn philosophy upon itself in service to humanity, as opposed to you know abstract reasonings um, and speculative debate. Um, and he thinks that you know humanity is going to be rewarded if it goes goes that direction. I don't think the history of philosophy went that direction, but um, maybe we can revive it. Um, yeah, so he sort of finishes off by saying, you know, you've got to reconcile the profound inquiry with clearness and truth with novelty. And I think, you know, again, to reiterate what I've been saying, there's a very basic interpretation of Hume as, you know, mere empiricist, you know, skeptic, just, you know, saying that causation isn't real. Um, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of novelty in his writing if you, if you read between the lines. And, um, yeah, there's also, like I said, it can be a joy to read when you pick out the parts where he's being sort of um, subversively quite catty towards philosophy as such. Um, so yeah, hopefully you enjoyed that and hopefully I will see you on the next reading. Thanks very much.